All right, it is my pleasure to introduce you, to you today our final speaker, Luke Wagner. Luke is a distinguished engineer at Fastly, where he works in the office of the CTO on WebAssembly standards and evolution. Luke is also currently a co-chair of the W3C WebAssembly Working Group and champion of the component model proposal. Before Fastly, he worked on Firefox for 11 years where he helped create WebAssembly itself. And today, he's going to explain to us what is a component model and why. Please help me welcome Luke. Hey everybody, uh, thank you for that introduction. Very excited to be here. And yeah, my name is Luke Wagner. I work at Fastly, and I'm gonna be trying to answer the question, what is a WebAssembly component and why? But first, to motivate that, I'd like to ask the more basic question, what is WebAssembly and why? And I appreciate that we're here at WASMCon, and people probably already have a pretty good idea of this, but, but just bear with me for just a second. Um, so to quote the standard definition, WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. WASM is designed as a portable compilation target for programming languages. And I think the operative phrase here is compilation target, which means we can take our variety of source languages, and then in addition to being able to compile them to all the different native instruction sets, we can compile it to WebAssembly. And then we can take that WASM and send it to a browser or WASM engine of some sorts, which will internally compile it to the actual instruction set it's running on. And what this buys us is portability, determinism if we need it, control flow integrity, and uh, sub-process sandboxing. So what are we doing with all these cool powers? Well, today, in browsers, a popular use case is to port a large code base, especially C++. And examples include Unity, AutoCAD, Photoshop, Earth, and Figma. Also, offloading compute-intensive subtasks from JavaScript to WASM, with examples including codecs, compression, inference, encryption, and filters. Outside a browser, it's popular to embed WASM in your existing system to bring your guest code closer to your system. And examples include CDNs, like we're doing it fastly, databases, client apps, SaaS apps, Kubernetes, and streams. And lastly, people are using WASM to explore alternative models of distributed computing, like serverless, distributed actors, record and replay, and edge computing, also like we're doing at Fastly. And so th that's awesome. That's a lot of great uses of WASM leaning into its special powers. But here at WASMCon, it's fun to ask, like, what if we wanted to see 100 times more WASM usage? What big new use cases could we unlock that would make this happen? And so I'd like to consider four. Number one. Today, on many compute platforms, the client controls the application code, of course, and the platform controls the implementation and the interface, but the platform also controls the language runtime and therefore the choice of language you have and the SDKs you use to access the platform. This is both a lot of work for the platform to build and maintain and also limits the choices of the client. So instead, we can lean into WASM's language neutrality and linkable modules and say, yeah, the platform controls the implementation interface, and the client controls their application and compiles that to a WASM module, but also gets to pick the language tool chain. And the language tool chain brings a language runtime compiled to WASM, but we don't want to duplicate that in every client application, so let's share that in a registry so that we're actually sharing the machine code at runtime. And the language tool chain also brings a bindings generator, which can generate the SDK that the client uses to access the platform interface. And then it's these three WASM modules linked together that is the actual client application. And yeah, this is a pretty normal thing to do with like open API and gRPC, but we're doing this without any network stack involved so that we can have a, achieve a very lightweight embedding. And so the wins from this approach are the client gets to choose the language, the host does a whole lot less work, and this also helps emerging languages because now you don't have to ask permission to like run your new language on someone's platform. You just, you know, build the tool chain. And so I call this use case SDKs for free. Number two. Today, if I want to reuse code, I have a ton of language choices and packages and registries, uh, but they're all relatively siloed from each other, so it's difficult to reuse code across language boundaries. And furthermore, when I build an application, all those packages that I use transitively go into the same memory space where they can collide in shared memory. And they also share the same capabilities for things like secrets and file systems and network services. So if a package upstream that I'm using is exploited and I pull that in as a transitive dependency, it has access to all the capabilities of my application, even though that particular package didn't really need that particular capability. So we can lean into WASM's language neutrality and sandbox support and say, let's have a single registry 
of different packages from different languages compiled into WASM modules, ideally one that stores its contents in an OCI registry so it can reuse all the existing cloud infrastructure that exists today. And then when I build a single application, I want to put each one of those packages in its separate memory and give it just the capabilities it needs. And by doing that, I can reuse code from any language while mitigating supply chain attacks. So I call this use case, oh, and it also helps emerging languages, because when you're a new language, you don't have to like bootstrap a whole package registry of access to all this code already built in all these other languages. So I call this use case secure polyglot packages. Number three. Today, if I want to avoid a big ball of mud architecture, one option is to adopt a microservice architecture, where I put my separate modules and separate services and have them talk to each other through HTTP, which achieves a very strong degree of isolation, but it does come at the cost of significant complexity and runtime overhead. And maybe that's what I need. I want to, if I want to independently scale the services as part of the overall scalability of my application, but what if I don't need that independent scalability? And this is like a popular question that, you know, every month it seems like there's a top-rated Hacker News post that's like emphatically saying, like, just because you need modularity doesn't mean you need microservices. And instead, they'll recommend a modular monolith, where you just, you know, use modules in your source code language, and you just call between them with fast function calls. And this addresses that complexity and overhead, but now I'm generally limited to a single language or a single language family on the VM I'm running on. And I have relatively less isolation because there's shared global state in, in most languages that these modules um, share. So instead, we can lean into WASM's language neutrality, sandbox support, and linkable modules, and say we'll compile the separate modules to separate WASM modules and give them separate memories. But we'll still be able to do fast function calls between them because that's a thing WASM can do today. And by doing this, we combine the benefits of the microsurface architecture with the memory isolation and language choice with the benefits of the modular monolith with the efficient cross-module calls. And so I call this use case modularity without microservices. And lastly, number four. Today, if I want to factor out code between teams, let's say I have four teams with four services, and I want to factor out some authentication or RPC or observability logic, maybe have that owned by my platform engineering team, I've got two popular options. One, I can embed that shared code in each service independently as an embedded shared library. And this works, but it's harder to update. When I make update the shared code, I have to like roll that out to all the different services. There's a certain amount of per language effort uh, to make that library if I'm using multiple languages. And it's uh, libraries can be a leak your abstraction. So what's popular in the service mesh world is to use a sidecar proxy pattern where you say, I'm gonna have my service talk through a network stack to the shared code, which then talks to like the real network. And that can address those previous three problems, but it does come at the cost of significant runtime overhead. So instead, we can lean into WASM sandbox support and linkable modules and say my separate teams separately develop their code and compile them to separate WASM modules. And between those teams, there's usually some sort of interface. Sometimes it's called an internal, uh, internal developer platform. And when I deploy my business logic module to the internal developer platform, I just link it with the other module to make a compound module. And now I can deploy that to the, under, to the underlying infrastructure platform, which just has a WASM engine. It doesn't have to know anything about my internal developer platform. It's just running two WASM modules linked together. So the benefits of this approach is that it combines the low overhead calls between modules with the strong encapsulation between layers. And this really starts to matter once you have multiple layers. For example, let's say my business logic is actually you know, heavily using POSIX and doing lots of file system-y stuff, and I don't actually have NFS in my internal developer platform. I have a key value store. So I want to virtualize the file system using emerging WASM ecosystem tooling that I'll actually be talking about next. So to do that, I can, at build time, I can link those two modules together, get the compound module, link it a third time. Now I have three modules that I'm running on my WASM engine, which still doesn't know what's going on above it. It's just running three cool modules linked together. Let's do it one more time, because let's say I'm developing my internal developer platform not directly on the infrastructure, but on some function as a service or platform as a service, who can develop its own higher level features and infra infrastructure abstractions as a WASM module that I link together. Now I have four modules linked together, and you can kind of see the pattern. And as the number of layers grow, I hope this illustrates that you, know, you really want that low cost, strong isolation. So I call this use case virtual platform layering. So okay, so four use cases, how do we support these use cases? And I think fundamentally what this requires is we have to expand the scope of what we're building from a new compiled target for existing ecosystems where we're comparable to things like x86 and ARM to a new ecosystem built around a new compiled target, where instead we're comparable to things like containers, NPM, Nix, Maven, Helm, Debian, 
So what makes an ecosystem? Well, I don't have a fully general answer, but at least just for the comparable things I just talked about, you know, the pattern seems to be you start with a standard distributable format. You have tools to build that format from different sources. You have tools to deploy and run that format. And then you have tools to share and compose that format. So for example, in the container world, OCI, of course, defines the distributable what's a standard container. Docker build will you know, build you a container from sources. Docker run and Kubernetes can run it and deploy it. And to share and compose, I can use Docker push and Docker compose. So the natural question is, well, can we just use WASM? I mean, obviously, it's definitely a standard distributable format. Um, but the challenge is, oh, and of course, it has existing WASM compilers that we want to we use. Um, but the challenge is WASM mostly supports shared memory linking. So if I have two WASM modules and I want to link them together, practically the only way to do that is to have them share memory so they can pass compound values through that shared memory. And that's kind of like an operating system DLL or shared object. But what we need for those previous use cases is when I compose them, I want them to still have their own separate, shared, separate memories that aren't shared. And then I need some way of passing complex values between them and passing ownership of resources and other things that can't be copied between them. More like an operating system executable. So we could almost use WASM, but it's just a little too low level. So the next natural question is, well, OK, well, let's just wrap that with some POSIX and get up WASM executable. But let's, let's speed run this. People don't just distribute a single POSIX executable because you don't just want one. You have usually a collection of executables that need to work together, some configuration files, and then some static assets, and then a little directory structure. So you don't just distribute that. You bundle them up into what? A container. So we speed run this. It's just containers, but with WASM as the instruction set in the middle, which is fine. That could be useful, but it doesn't unlock these kind of exciting new use cases. So I think if we want to do that, we need something new, something that wraps WASM so we can use existing compilers. Um, and that thing we're proposing is called a component. So finally, getting to the title of the talk, what is a component? So in one sentence, a component is an emerging, standard, portable, lightweight, finely sandboxed, cross-language, compositional module, which is a super loaded sentence. So let me break that down word by word, going backwards. So a component is a module by having imports, internal definitions, and exports. Where imports are things like imported functions, like a log function. And in general, imports capture the I.O. performed by the components and its implementation dependencies, instead of a fixed set of syscalls or a fixed runtime global namespace. The internal definitions, this is the meat of the component, this is the actual code that runs, and this is just embedded WASM modules, one or more. And this is 99% of the bytes, and it can call the imports. But components can also nest other components, so they're recursive by nature. And lastly, exports just take internal definitions and imports and then make them public to the clients of this components with names and types. And so if I had a graphics plugin, plug it might export a tick and a render function. And in general, exports capture host events and triggers and how generally client code calls into the components instead of having a single fixed main function. And what's important is that all interaction with the outside world goes through these imports and exports. There's not some sort of side door where the WASM just reaches out and touches other WASM goes through the imports and exports, which means that we want to say, what's the type of this component? We want to say, what does it look like from the outside? All we need to describe it is just the imports and exports, their names and types. And this concept's so important that in WIT, which is the IDL we're building as part of the component model, it has a first class concept for this called a world. And a world's just a synonym for component type, but it's a little less technical sounding and more fun to say. Um, so a world defines a contract between guests and hosts. Uh, where guest components target a world by they can call the imports and implement the exports. And a host target, uh, supports a world by implementing the imports and calling the exports. And we can import and export not just functions, but whole interfaces. For example, this file system interface is a collection of things, including like a read and write function. Or I could export an HTTP handler interface. And then once we can import and export interfaces, then we can give them standardized names so that when we mean the same thing, we can say the same thing and interoperate. And so in this context, you can frame WASI's job is standardizing common interfaces for use by many worlds. For example, in my plugin world here, but like a thousand other ones too. Not defining a single fixed world that all hosts have to implement and that all code has to target. And if you want to hear a lot more cool stuff about WASI, check out Dan Goman's talk later today. So that's what it means for a component to be a module. What does it mean to be a compositional module? And this is a, a nuanced term that I won't attempt to fully define in the abstract, 
Rather, I just want to show by way of example, here's a thing you can do with components that I think is rather compositional. So I want to start with a C program written 20 years ago that generates a thumbnail, let's say, and I want to expose this as a web service through HTTP and then locally test that. So I'm going to start using WASI SDK to compile the C code, and that will generate a component that you know, expects POSIX things, so it imports a file system and exports a main function. But what I want is a component that has no imports and is kind of just a pure computation. It takes an input stream of bytes and gives me back an output stream of bytes, because this is a very usable component that I can use in a lot of places. So to do this, I use a new tool in the Bytecode Alliance called WASI Vert. This is uh, Guy Bedford's going to talk about this later today. And what WASI Vert will do is adapt the exports to take the incoming stream and store it into a virtual file system in linear memory, and adapt the imports to implement file system operations in terms of streams. And once we've done this, we now have a very reusable component, so we want to publish it to a registry so other people in other languages can reuse it. To do, the, use, to do that, we use another new Bytecode Alliance tool called Warg. And Danny Makave is going to be talking about that, I believe, tomorrow. And so once I've published this component, I can use it from JavaScript, let's say, to implement my HTTP interface. I want to compile that to a component. To do that, I'll use another new Bytecode Alliance tool called Componentize.js, which Guy Bedford will also be talking about later today, which will generate a component that exports an HTTP handler, which is how it receives HTTP requests to implement this API. And to do that, it'll call Thumify and then cache the results in a WASI cache. Now, I have two components, but to deploy them, I need to have one deployable thing. So to do that, I use WASM Compose, which is also a Bytecode Alliance tool that exists today. And that composed parent component now targets a very simple world, this caching server world that just implements a cache and exports a handler. So I can run this on a whole variety of different cloud, edge, and network uh, hardware because it's very easy to implement and call those interfaces. So that's the component I can like run in production. But now let's say I want to like test this locally on my machine. And then for the sake of argument, my local machine uh, only supports the command world, which only knows about file systems and sockets, but not HTTP and caches. So to run this deployment component on my local machine, I want to compose it one more time using WASM Compose, and we're using two components in the registry. I'm going to link in an FS cache component here to implement the cache in terms of, say, a directory in the file system, like in my local testing directory. And then I'm going to link in an HTTP server here that's going to speak raw sockets and call my WASI HTTP handler. And this will allow me to test my production component locally as part of my local development workflow. And I think what's really interesting about this use case is that we have two implementations of WASI file system in this one composite. There's the outer one, which is probably talking to the native system. And then we have the inner one that was fully virtualized by WASI verts. And like, it needs to be totally different than the outer one, right? Because they're doing totally different things. And this, I think, is the key to virtual platform layering. And it also suggests that maybe instead of WASI standing for WebAssembly System Interface, instead it should stand for WebAssembly Standard Interfaces. Uh, credit to this point to Oscar Spencer, author of The Grain Language, because I think it's a great point, because we're not necessarily talking to the system through these interfaces. Like, virtualization is like a big part of what we're doing here. And so, yeah, that's, we can retcon that without changing all the acronyms, so that's good. Um, so that's what it means to be a compositional component. So you can do stuff like this. So that's how we, it, it kind of feels to use components. What does it look like to actually like implement one of these things in like a normal programming language, which gets the cross-language support? So it starts when you want to target a world. And let's say I want to implement this in JavaScript. So for JavaScript, I can just import the imports with import. So I can import a log function and export the exports. So I export a run function, and then the JS bindings will make sure that list of string turns into a JavaScript array of strings. So I can just call join on it produces a string, and I can pass that out to the log function, and that'll just work. So I can componentize that with componentize.js, yes, producing a component that targets this world. In Python, I can use a Python import to import the log function. Python doesn't have exports, but we can kind of emulate them by saying you define a class whose name matches the world, and then the methods of the class are the exports of the world. So then I can define a run function that way. I can componentize that with another new Bytecode Alliance tool that Joel Dice will be talking about tomorrow called componentize pi. And lastly, I can implement this component in Rust by implementing a trait generated that has all the exports of the world in the trait. And then I can call the imports through an external crate that was generated by the bindings generator. And I can compile that to a component with Cargo Components, which is another Bytecode Alliance project. And so to deduplicate or to not have to have all these language tool chains doing the same work, we have a bunch of shared projects like Bitbindgen and Wasm Tools that try to factor out as much of the shared wit logic, parsing logic, and the type validation, the type uh, rules, 
into these shared projects, so that way each language tool chain is just focusing on the interesting bits of that language, and it's easier to add new languages. In addition to these, you know, string and list types I've shown, we have a whole bunch of other value types, um, records, tuples, flags, variants, enums, options, results. And for things that are in, so values are passed by copy between the memories, as we'll see next. Uh, for things I don't want to copy, they're because they're too big or because they're non-copyable, like a socket or a database connection, we have resource types. So for example, my world can import a buffer resource type with a constructor and an append method, and then I can use that type in other function signatures. And then to use this from, say, JavaScript, I just import a constructor function, buffer. And then in my JavaScript code, I can just call new buffer, and, and that calls the constructor. And I can call a method because the bindings generator put it on the prototype chain. And I can return ownership of the buffer by just returning the object handle. So that's a taste of what it looks like to, uh, you know, target this from various languages. But how does it work kind of at the lower level, in the bits and bytes, which gets into the fine sandboxing of components? So fundamentally, each component has its own separate linear memory and tables. And just to show how this works from the example, let's say my first component exports a secret store interface, where a secret store interface defines a secret resource and a get function for looking up secrets. And my second component wants to import that secret store and export a run function. I don't have time to like show the full implementation, but you know, the gist of it is the Rust code will implement some traits to, for the get function and another trait for the expose method. And then the JavaScript code will get to import the get function and call that just passing a string, getting back a handle to the secret, and then it can call the expose method. So let's talk through how this kind of call actually works under the hood. So a call comes in from either the host or some client components to my run function. The JS engine puts that string in linear memory and we get a pointer to it, address four. Now I pass that pointer to the, uh, pointer to the key to uh, the get function, but that's a pointer into JavaScript's linear memory. Rust does not have access to that linear memory. So the component model defines, very, uh, specifies an adapter that sits in between the two components, which will copy the key string into the Rust memory and getting a pointer to the Rust memory, which is actually passed into the Rust code. Now in the Rust code, we can call the underlying HTTP API that you know, gets the key from the database or the secret from the database, which we get into linear memory now. And let's say the secret is XYZ at address one. Now instead of just returning this key, we want to put it into a resource. So we're going to take that address and stick it into this resource, which is opaque to clients. And now we have a handle to this resource in our table. So I'm going to return this handle to this secret resource that I've just created by saying return the handle at index zero in my table. And the adapter will then move that handle into the JavaScript table. So now JavaScript has, owns the handle to this secret. It can't get inside and see that one, but it can, knows it can call the expose method uh, by passing index zero into the table to the expose function, which will then say call you know, the expose method on this uh, secret. So hopefully kind of this example gives an impression that this is a lot like inner process communication where we're copying values between memories and we're passing handles to things kind of like file descriptors, but we're using fast local synchronous function calls so it can be a lot lighter weight. And then speaking of lighter weights, components inherit the same lightweight execution model as WASM today. So today if you have a WASM module and you want to run it on an execution platform, there are generally two phases that you can do stuff in. There's the ahead of time phase and the runtime phase. And from kind of a server context, you would say like the ahead of time phase is what happens in the control plane when I deploy a component, and the runtime phase is what happens like in the data plane when a request comes in. And so ahead of time, when I deploy a WASM module, I compile that to machine code, I can blast that out across a fleet, and then when a request comes in, the WASM engine can very cheaply spawn up a new instance with a fresh memory reusing that shared code. And this is how we achieve the sub-process sandboxing and microsecond instantiation we have today. So when I deployed component, there's multiple WASM modules inside that thing, so I do one up first upfront step of fusing them all together into one WASM module using the multi-memory feature of WASM. Once I've done that, though, the whole rest of the pipeline is effectively the same. We're just compiling the WASM machine code and distributing it over the fleet. The only difference being is because we're using multi-memory, we can have multi-memories, multiple memories in each one of those instances. But importantly, there's no big additional component runtime with a whole bunch of component services and other stuff you might have seen from component models of the past. It's mostly just WASM running as usual. But we do have a new option if this component is reusing shared modules in a registry, which is that the execution platform can maintain its own registry, kind of shadow registry, of compiled versions of each of these shared modules, so that when I deploy a component that shares modules that are already in the cache, I can 
have a linker sort of script that points and reuses uh, uh, these shared modules and says how they link together. And then at execution time, this is effectively giving me DLL-like code sharing between components, where I'm sharing the code, which is immutable, but not the state. So that's how components are lightweight. Lastly, components are portable by layering on top of the WebAssembly core. So the WebAssembly core has a formal specification, a reference interpreter, and test suite. And with component model, we're working on the same things. WebAssembly core is, of course, in browsers today and has been since 2017 and is exposed to the rest of the browser through the JavaScript API. And we're proposing to extend that so components will be exposed through roughly the same API to browsers. But of course, this isn't implemented in browsers A, and it'll take probably quite some time to be so. So today, what we have is a tool, also, uh, that Guy Bedford will be talking about called jcotranspile, that can turn a component into a core module and JavaScript glue code that it does the same things the component would do. And people are actually using this today to run components as WASM in browsers today. WASI is then layered on top of the component model in its different proposals and interfaces. And where possible, these can also be polyfilled on browsers today in terms of web APIs and JavaScript polyfills. So in a nutshell, that's what a component is. And I know we've been talking about this for a little while, but it's finally becoming real. Um, planning and development, uh, or we're planning a developer preview release this year called Preview 2. It covers both the component model and a subset of WASI interfaces. The top line goals is stability and backwards compatibility. In particular, we have an automatic conversion to convert Preview 1 core modules into Preview 2 components. And then we're committing to, in the future, having a similar tool to commit, uh, convert Preview 2 components into whatever comes next. And the features of Preview 2 include a first wave of languages, in particular Rust, JS, Python, Go, and C. A first wave of WASI proposals, namely file systems, sockets, CLI, HTTP, and possibly others a browser and node polyfill in the form of JCO Transpile, preliminary support for WASI virtualization in the form of WASI verts, preliminary support for component composition in the form of WASM Compose, and experimental component registry tooling in the form of WARG. So if this is interesting, you want to find out more, there's a lot of great details in the Bytecode Alliance roadmap blog post written by Bailey Hayes on the Bytecode Alliance blog. So that's what we'll be doing this year. Next year, it's all about improving the concurrency story because Preview 2 does the best it can, but concurrency is admittedly warty. Async interfaces are gonna to be too complex for direct use and need manual glue code, and our general goal is to be able to use the automatic bindings directly without manual glue code. Uh, streaming performance isn't as good as it could be, and concurrency is not currently composable. Just to say, two components doing concurrent stuff will end up blocking each other in some cases. And if you virtualize one as an async interface, it ends up being that you have to virtualize them all. So Preview 3 stay, uh, aims to fix this by adding native future and stream types to WIT and components, which will allow us to build ergonomic, integrated automatic bindings for many languages, an efficient IOU ring friendly ABI, and composable concurrency. For example, in Preview 2, we need two interfaces for HTTP, one for outgoing requests and one for incoming ones, and they have different types and different signatures. In, preview, in the transition to Preview 3, we'll be able to merge these and just have one interface, WASI Handler, which is kind of the obvious one, which I've a little simplified here by taking out the result and other sorts of types, but basically that. And what that will allow us to do is have a single component that both imports and exports the same interface. So I import a handler so I can make outgoing requests, and I export a handler to receive incoming requests. And because they're the same interface, I can take two services that I want to chain together and just link them directly together using component linking. And now, executing the whole compound request is just an async function call, which can support our modularity without microservices use case. So yeah, that should be pretty cool, so please stay tuned to preview three. So in conclusion, a component is an emerging, standard, portable, lightweight, finely sandboxed, cross-language, compositional module. We want to use components to grow a WASM ecosystem, providing SDKs for free, secure polyglot packages, modularity without microservices, and virtual platform layering. There is a stable developer two preview release coming soon. And if this is exciting to you, please get involved. There's a Bytecode Alliance Zulip chat. There is a meetings repo in the Bytecode Alliance org that lists all the meetings, uh, uh, minutes and future ones that you can join even if you're not a Bytecode Alliance member. Everyone's welcome to join. And there's this Componentize the World event this Friday, which uh, you should definitely go to and talk to the people who are building all the tools and start building stuff yourself. So thank you very much. <laughs>